Thank you, Canaan. We're continuing a series uh, that I've entitled Christ Enthroned, covering Revelation chapters 4 and 5. <clears throat> and although uh, I've entitled this Christ Enthroned, we don't actually read anywhere in here where it's specifically stated that Christ is seated on the throne. In the book of the Revelation, God is always seated on the throne. It's repeated several times throughout the book. <clears throat> But at this point, I do want to show in Scripture that this, especially here in Revelation chapter 5, this is when the Lord's Christ was seated on the throne of heaven, at the Father's right hand, which is the throne of David. This was prophesied in the 16th Psalm, verse 8, I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. And verse 11, Thou wilt show me the path of life, in thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. And you know that the apostles quoted that text in, in the book of Acts when they preached the gospel. Then we have the word of Jesus in Matthew 26, verse 64. Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power. And at Pentecost, Peter preached that Jesus had been exalted to the throne of David in Acts 2.34. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Also notice in these texts that I read that, that many of them, they're proclaiming something that has already happened, not something that's going to happen. Paul preached this in Romans 8, 34. It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. In Ephesians 1, 20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. And Colossians 3, 1, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth, on the right hand of God. And in Hebrews 1, 3, Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. And Hebrews 8, 1, we have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. And Hebrews 10, 12, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. And Hebrews 12, 2, <clears throat> Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen. That's just from the Apostle Paul. Now the Apostle Peter also preached this in his epistle, 1 Peter 3.22, who is gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. And finally, we have the testimony of Jesus himself in Revelation chapter 3, verse 21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, again, past tense, overcame and am, present tense, and am set down with my Father in his throne. Amen. Amen. David foresaw this and he wrote, the 24th Psalm that we're familiar with, Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even be lift up, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Well, that's what we're reading about here in Revelation chapter 5. These are just stated from different points of view. A king is not without a throne, and especially not this king, Jesus the Christ, who is the root of David, an heir to the throne that God promised he would establish forever and ever. 
So although we, we will not read in Revelation chapter 5 any statements like, and then the Lamb took his seat on the right hand of God, <clears throat> that is in fact what we're reading about. So I, I thought it necessary to clarify that. <clears throat> so at this point in John's vision, again Revelation chapter 5, beginning at verse 8, the Lamb has now appeared in the midst of the throne, and he is seen as the one and only man who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. So now we read about the response around the throne of heaven. <laughs> Verse 8, When he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them <clears throat> harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. Note now that this did not happen until after the Lamb took the book. <clears throat> In the following verses, there's going to be a new song sung, and the worthiness of the Lamb is going to be proclaimed and agreed upon in heaven. But before that, John sees the four beasts and 24 elders fall down before the Lamb, having harps and golden vials full of the prayers of the saints. So some questions about this. Why, why did the beasts and the elders hold the prayers of saints and vials? And why do they have harps? Notice it does not say they played the harps, and it does not say they poured out what was in the vials. They just they held them. Why did they fall down before the Lamb with harps and prayers and not before God? Well, I considered these things. <clears throat> Jesus' presence at the right hand of God makes the prayers of the saints beautiful and sweet and soothing like the music of a harp or like the aroma of incense. We don't make them pleasant. It's not the beasts and the elders that make them pleasant. It's the presence of Jesus at the right hand of the Father that makes the prayers of saints pleasant. Jesus taught his disciples and he taught us in John 16, In that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. At that day ye shall ask in my name. And I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you, for the Father himself, the Father himself loveth you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came out from God. I came forth from the Father and am come into the world Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. The so prayers offered up to the Father in the name of Jesus Christ are received as the music of harps and as the sweet aroma, a sweet fragrance to God. The idea seems to be that the presence of the enthroned Christ has validated the saints' prayers to God, and especially the prayers that come up to God after His ascension. And I also see that the prayers are connected with the book in the Lamb's right hand. As soon as he took the book, the beasts and the elders fell down with the harps and with the vials. <clears throat> the book is, that is sealed with seven seals is God's will and his purpose for the world unto the end of time. And it was put down in a book so that we could see it being delivered to the, to the Lamb, to his Lamb. It's been given to him now, the root and offspring of David. So from this point onward, the Lamb of God rules over everything except God himself. And primarily, he's saving God's elect and putting down all opposition against God and reconciling all things to God. But also from this point, the devil has come down to you, inhabitants of the earth, having great wrath, for he knoweth that he hath but a short time. So during this time, which is the last time, there are going to be an abundance of prayers lifted up to God. Amen. Prayers of the saints. Knowing that our Lord is risen from the dead and reigning from his throne in heaven, we come to the throne of grace with boldness and confidence. We make our petitions known in faith and with thanksgiving. And this is a most pleasant arrangement to God and the saints. But see, this is due to Christ being at his right hand. Amen. Christ's worthiness is proclaimed now in, in verse 9. 
they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Well, everything that is new, truly new, has its beginning in heaven. <clears throat> the beasts and the elders sing a new song here because they've seen something new. God has done something new. You recall it previously in chapter 4, they proclaimed God's holiness and righteousness and his wisdom in his uh, power over his creation. Chapter 4, verse 10, The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Seems like this song here, they could see that God's will was being done in all of his creation. He had complete power and control over everything that he has made. But now this is a new song they're singing. God is greater than what they had seen initially. They saw this in, in the enthronement of his lamb in his right hand, and of course, all the accomplishments of the lamb. And so this provoked a new song. Now the beasts and elders have something new and greater to sing about that God has done. <clears throat> and they aren't singing about creation in this song. Thou art worthy to open the book. Every time I read Revelation chapter 5, I've never come to the conclusion that this is much ado about nothing. When the saints read this, <clears throat> None of us will think that Christ is not so worthy of this much praise and honor. By faith, all the saints in heaven and earth from every generation have witnessed the enthronement of Jesus Christ. And by faith, every one of us joins ourselves to the beasts and the 24 elders around the throne in glorious worship and adoration and exaltation, magnification and praise of the Lamb of God. I, uh, I want to read this hymn, Hail Thou Once Despised Jesus, from Brother John Bakewell. Hail Thou Once Despised Jesus, Hail Thou Galilean King. Thou didst suffer to release us, Thou didst free salvation bring. Hail Thou Agonizing Savior, Bearer of our sin and shame, By Thy merits we find favor, Life is given through Thy name. Paschal Lamb, by God appointed, all our sins on thee were laid. By almighty love anointed, thou hast full atonement made. All thy people are forgiven through the virtue of thy blood. Opened is the gate of heaven. Peace is made twixt man and God. Amen. Jesus, hail, enthroned in glory, there forever to abide. All the heavenly hosts adore thee, seated at thy Father's side. There for sinners thou art pleading, there thou dost our place prepare, ever for us interceding, till in glory we appear. Worship, honor, power, and blessing thou art worthy to receive. Thou wast, <clears throat> pardon me, loudest praises without ceasing, meet it is for us to give. Help, ye bright angelic spirits, bring your sweetest, noblest lays. Help to sing our Savior's merits. Help to chant Emmanuel's praise. Amen. 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 Never in human history has mankind rejoiced so extensively at the exaltation of another man. <clears throat> there is a unique ownership in our rejoicing in Jesus Christ. Normally men are prone... <clears throat> to do this kind of rejoicing only when it involves their own persons. Normally men are prone to be envious when they see another man receiving praise and exalted above themselves. When someone else gets the glory, men naturally begin to think that the glorying is too much. And then the one receiving the praise is not truly worthy of it. And we become suspicious of one receiving the praise, <clears throat> thinking that perhaps that is not right. <clears throat> there is too much, there is a concern that too much glorying will cause a man to become conceited 
and abusive with the honor he has been given. And it's a common saying, absolute power corrupts absolutely. But none of this is true of rejoicing in Christ Jesus. Amen. Quite the opposite is true. Beasts, elders, angels, and saints all together, we feel the totality of our praise and adoration of the Lamb of God can never approach His worthiness. Amen. All see that He is the only truly worthy man. I appreciate Brother Bakewell's last two lines where he calls for help. Yeah. Help from the angelic spirits. Help to sing and help to chant Emmanuel's praise. This is the result of seeing Jesus for who He truly is and knowing what He has done. Around the throne, the only kind of worship that exists is worship in spirit and in truth. So this kind of exaltation of the Lamb of God is the result of seeing that He is truly worthy. And why is the Lamb worthy to take the book and open the seals? For thou wast slain. Yeah. Now, the way of this world is that the greatest men are usually the wealthiest men. The ones considered the most worthy are the ones who, so to speak, fight their way to the top of the food chain and exercise their power over other men to get what they want. The world is nearly always struggling among men for control over the planet. But the lamb is worthy because he was slain. He's worthy because of what he did first for God his Father, and secondarily what he did for Adam's race, by the way, an undeserving and alienated, rebellious and unthankful race. Right. No man asked for a savior. Yeah. God promised he would send a man to save his people from their sins, but when he came he was neither known nor received by men in general. In fact, the ones he came to save are the ones that pursued him to his death. However, he was not a martyr. God's lamb was not accidentally killed. He did not die of a sickness. He was in complete control of his own death, and yet the song proclaims, For thou wast slain. The act that made the Lamb of God worthy to open the book and to loose the seals was an act of humiliation and of suffering. And if we would be found worthy in heaven, this is the way for us also. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. And again, this famous passage from Philippians 2, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let this mind be in you. Any man that exalts himself has not seen Jesus. <clears throat> but Jesus was not slain just to provide us with an example of living humbly. His death was a very great work, the accomplishments of which we have yet to fully see. Jesus' death was both a sacrifice and a payment. The death of God's Lamb quelled the wrath of God that was against us. It was the propitiation. It made atonement. It actually satisfied. It made peace between God and man. Jesus' death is ultimately going to satisfy all offenses against God. When we've been hurt or offended, <clears throat> by someone, the offending person can apologize, but sometimes that doesn't make the hurt go away. Yeah. Doesn't make the damage that was done go away. The hurt from an offense can linger sometimes for years after the offense has been removed. But Jesus' sacrifice has the power to take away all offense. Amen. Has the power not only from us, but from God. 
he is truly satisfied in his lamb, Jesus Christ. So his death did so much more than just pay for sins. <clears throat> and we have been redeemed. They say, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Redeemed means he bought us. The saints are not just forgiven sinners now. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Amen. And from Galatians 4, Because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Christ Jesus has turned the situation completely around, where once we were God's enemies, condemned, now we are sons and heirs with his only begotten son. This is a real work involving real change and new creatures. God is not pretending sin is gone so that everything is okay. Jesus truly took sin away and satisfied God. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Amen. This was not a small work that Jesus accomplished in his death. There are men out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation among the saints of God. This is too great a work to be limited to a small number of people, to one or two nations, or to just one denomination. If God is doing the choosing, and he is, yes. I find it hard to believe that he would just choose a small number, yeah. that he would choose an inferior number or a minority to be his heirs. When God's grace is so manifold and his wisdom manifold and his mercies manifold, I find it hard to believe that he would choose men from just one or two nations or one or two languages. God is going to be very well represented in his temple. Amen. Not only this, but the redemption of people from every kindred, tongue, people, and nation will show that there were none that were too far off for Jesus to save. In the great judgment day when the sheep are gathered together on the right, Christ Jesus is going to be honored by the great variety of people that were redeemed to God by his blood. Amen. And he says, has made us unto our God kings and priests. Yes. Amen. Now the lamb did not redeem us so that we could be ourselves. He redeemed us to God. And we are, as we already read, we are not servants, but sons. He made us kings and priests unto God. This, again, is some of what was accomplished in the Lamb being slain. We are kings and priests in the service of God. Kings reign and priests intercede and offer up offerings and sacrifices. <clears throat> These are not mere titles bestowed upon the people of God. This actually began when we were buried with Christ and raised with him. Only the new man can be a king and a priest. In fact, our primary work as kings and priests is to rule over our own flesh and to offer up thanksgiving and to offer up intercessions for our brethren. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. That's not something that we can wait for. <clears throat> we, need, we need to be able to reign now. That's right. yeah, that's right. We have life now. Amen. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. God is going to bruise Satan under the feet of the saints because the saints are presently reigning. We are presently winning the fight and overcoming the world, yeah. the flesh and the devil, by the grace of God. 
Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Everyone who serves God has been given a measure of power for the work. God doesn't have any servants who perform menial tasks. There are no such things in the kingdom of God. All are redeemed kings and priests unto God. Every one of us is a representative of God. He also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Amen. And finally, they say, and we shall reign on the earth. <clears throat> Presently, we reign over what we have been given to reign over, which is our own selves. Notice they did not sing, we shall reign over the earth, but on the earth. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Amen. Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Reigning in a peaceful environment where there are no enemies is very different from reigning in conflict and in the presence of enemies. But because of Christ, we have already overcome the world by faith. Again, ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen. We reign and we overcome on a moment-by-moment -moment basis by looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And as he overcame, and as he was seated at the Father's right hand and honored in heaven, this is the same way for us. This is our time of humiliation. This is where we suffer with Christ. It is the time of the crucifixion of our flesh. Yes. And in these things we presently reign on the earth. Yes. Right now we are occupying till our Lord comes again. But when he appears, we are going to enter into a different reign on the earth. And he said unto them, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in very little, have thou authority over ten cities. Amen. Amen. There will be a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness, and we are going to reign over our inheritance without opposition. We will all be perfected representatives of God, each in our own ministry, glorious kings and priests unto our God. These are some of the things that Jesus accomplished in his death and some of the reasons for his worthiness to take the book and loose the seals thereof. Amen. The lamb was slain for God and for us. And in this, this is how we have ownership of his reign. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Hark, 10,000 harps and voices sound the note of praise above. Jesus reigns and heaven rejoices. Jesus reigns, the God of love. See, he sits on yonder throne. Jesus rules the world alone. Jesus, hail, whose glory brightens all above and gives it worth. Lord of life, thy smile enlightens, cheers and charms thy saints on earth. When we think of love like thine, Lord, we own it, love divine. Yeah. Amen. King of glory, reign forever, thine an everlasting crown. Nothing from thy love shall sever those whom thou hast made thine own. Happy objects of thy grace, destined to behold thy face. Savior, hasten thine appearing. Bring, oh, bring the glorious day. When the awful summons hearing, heaven and earth shall pass away. Then with golden harps we'll sing, glory, glory to our King. Alleluia, alleluia. Alleluia. Amen. 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 Amen.